Hey students, this is our first uh, lesson in our unit on forces. And today what we're going to talk about is Newton's first law and net force. So we're going to um, just sort of start out with a general introduction to forces and what they are and what they do. We'll talk about different types of forces that are out there and how to represent them in something called a free body diagram. And then we'll use that information to calculate what's called the net force, the overall force on that object, and start talking about then um, the relationship between net force and the motion of the object. So let's get started. So first of all, the basic definition of a force that we can kind of work with is that it's a push or a pull. Um, and I think that's sort of a, a reasonable operational definition for us. I think we have an intuitive sense of what a force is, just something that's, you know, pushing or, or pulling an object in a certain direction. Another key element of the definition of a force is that it causes some sort of acceleration. And if we recall the definition of acceleration, that causes a change in velocity, which means it's either changing the speed of the object or it's changing the direction that the object is moving in, or both. Now there are two main ways that forces can be exerted upon an object. The first way is through direct contact, the two objects actually touching one another. So an example would be um, if I am pushing a chair across the room or you know, if I punch someone in the face. Those are contact forces where there's direct contact between the object that's exerting the force and the object that's receiving the force. And this is sort of an obvious one, but then um, there's another one that's a little bit less obvious and that's something called a field force. And that's a force that's exerted without any sort of direct touching between the two, um, the two things that are exerting the force and receiving the force. An example of this would be gravity. Obviously there's no like physical thing, gravity, that's like grabbing onto you and pulling you down towards the earth, and yet you feel a pull down towards the earth anyway. Um, sort of called spooky action at a distance. So. Um, gravity would be an example of a field force then. It's not that you actually have to be in physical contact with the Earth in order to feel it. It can travel through space. Okay. Um, forces of vector quantity, which means that the direction of the force matters. There's a big difference between being pulled downward and pushed upward. That causes different changes in the motion. And then our unit that we measure force in is something called a Newton, which we represent with a capital N. And just to kind of put Newtons in terms of units that we're already familiar with, one Newton is equal to one kilogram uh, being uh, accelerated at one meter per second squared. Okay, so that's our, our basic um, equivalent of what a Newton actually is to give a little bit of context. So let's start talking about something called free body diagrams. And basically those are just pictures that show us all the different forces that are acting on an object at one time. Now there are five main types of forces that you wanna be checking for when you're drawing your free body diagram to make sure that you include all of them. First one is weight. And that's one we're all familiar with. That's gonna be a downward force due to gravity. We represent weight with a, a capital F with a little subscript G. Another force that will usually be pretty apparent from the problem is an applied force. And that's just any sort of force that um, is being exerted upon the object directly. So if I'm pushing a chair or, um, you know, something like that, where, where it's gonna be, um, you know, a, a conscious effort on the part of someone or something. Okay. The next one is normal force and, and this one is uh, a little bit a little bit more subtle, I guess. So um, the normal force is going to be a pushing force that's perpendicular to some surface. Now, um, the the form of normal force that we end up seeing most often is this: when you are standing on the the floor of of the seventh story in this building, um, gravity is is pulling down on you. Gravity doesn't turn off. And yet somehow you're not falling through the floor and plummeting down to the center of the earth. And the reason for that is because there's a force exerted on you that's opposite gravity, that's holding you up. 
you can kind of think of it as the, the floor is holding you up against gravity, preventing you from falling down through, you know, and, and onto the center of the earth. That would be called the normal force. It's going to be this pushing force upward. It's sort of like shooting out of the ground, holding you up. Now, a key thing to note is that this force is always going to be perfectly perpendicular to the surface that you're standing on or our other object is, is resting on. So we've got this, this force of a, a surface holding up an object. It's sticking straight out of that surface. Our next type of force is a tension force, and that's going to be some sort of pulling force. Um, examples would be like hanging by a string or like pulling on a spring, things like that. And our last type of force that we'll talk about is friction, and that's going to be a force that opposes motion between two surfaces, opposes two surfaces rubbing against each other. Um, and so that's always going to be parallel to those surfaces, and oftentimes um, friction then is, is going to oppose um, an applied force, but really it could oppose any sort of force that's going to cause two, um, two surfaces to, to rub together. As soon as we've got um, some other force that's trying to, to push those two, um, you know, to, to rub and slide against each other, friction immediately shows up to try to oppose that force and oppose that motion. So let's consider some examples of free body diagrams now that I've told you all the different things that could be in them. So first we'll consider a, a pendulum, so some sort of object that's, that's hanging from a string and, and swinging back and forth. So we've got two main forces that are, are being exerted on our pendulum bob. Okay? The first one is gravity. And it exerts this downward force on the string because gravity pulls things down. So then I would take the, the weight in my pendulum and then just draw an arrow downward to indicate that the force of gravity is, is being pulled down. And then I'll just label that arrow F with a little G to indicate that that's my gravitational force or my weight acting on the object. Now this isn't the only force acting on the object or else it would go plummeting downward. There's also a tension force holding it up that's, that's provided by the string. Okay, so then I'll, I'll also draw an arrow going up and label it FT to indicate that we've got this tension force from the spring holding it up. Here's another example. Imagine a, a book sitting on a table. Hopefully this is not something that's new and foreign to you guys. All right. So um, once again, we've got two forces that are, are acting on this book. First one, gravity. Gravity is just about always going to be in everything. So we've got gravity exerting a downward force on the book, pulling it downward. But what's holding it up is that normal force exerted by the table. So the table is that surface that the book is resting on. It's holding it up, preventing it from falling to the ground. So we know that the table is exerting this normal force to hold it up. That, that arrow then is, is pointing upward and it's... Whoop, excuse me, straight out of that surface. So we see that the table is, is perfectly horizontal, which means that the normal force is going to be perfectly perpendicular to that and, and perfectly vertical. Okay, last one. So um, if I've got a rolly chair and I'm pushing it towards the left, this one's got a few more forces involved, right? So again, gravity, because gravity is pretty much always there. So gravity exerts this downward force, which I'll label FG holding up the chair, preventing it from, you know, crashing down to the center of the earth, is a normal force exerted by the floor to hold up the chair. And then since I'm pushing the chair towards the left, that means that I'm exerting an applied force that's directed towards the left. But then um, as soon as I do that, my applied force would cause there to be this, um, this, uh, rubbing motion between the wheels on the chair and the ground and friction immediately jumps in and says uh, uh we don't like that so that means that as soon as i start pushing there's a friction force then that opposes that pushing and um, exerts a force in the opposite direction towards the right okay so those are a few examples of some different free body diagrams now the next question you should probably ask yourself is why would we do this? Why do I want to draw a free body diagram? Um, and it's not just to draw pretty pictures. We actually have great use that we can get out of free body diagrams in that it allows us to calculate something called the net force on an object. And what net force means is it's the overall force on the object. So if I look at all the different forces acting on it, 
what's left in the end? What's the overall push or pull on the object? How much and in what direction? Now here's a key idea that I want you to take note of. This idea of net force is exactly the same as the resultant of all the force vectors. So all the work that we did last unit where we were talking about adding up all these vectors and finding one overall resultant vector, that's the same thing here. As soon as we do that with a bunch of force vectors, what we have calculated is net force. Okay, so the same way that um, before if we would talk about like a person travels three meters north and five meters east and two meters south and whatever, when we add those together, we get an overall displacement. In this situation, if we add up all these different forces, so five newtons to the north and three newtons to the west and, and whatnot, what we're calculating is the net force, the overall force on the object. Okay, so let's consider that a little bit. So first uh, question to consider, what's the net force on a kitten that's being pushed with six newtons to the east and two newtons to the west? So the first thing I'm going to do, even though this is a, a pretty simple problem, is I'm going to draw my free body diagram to identify all the forces acting on my object and which way that they're going. So here's my kitten. I've got um, one force vector to the right of six newtons and one force vector to the left of two newtons. And this makes it very clear then that, that since they're both going in the x direction, all I have to do is um, add everything going to the right, subtract everything going to the left. And I've got an overall net force of four newtons directed to the east. Okay. Another sample problem to consider. So now we've got a puppy and it's being pushed with four newtons to the west and three newtons to the north. So again, I'm gonna start by drawing that free body diagram to see all the different forces that are being exerted on my object. So we've got our four newtons to the west, three newtons to the north. By doing this, I can see I've got one vector in the x direction and one vector in the y direction, so I can't just add them together. I've got to, got to make a triangle in order to do this. All right? So I will redraw the vectors head to tail, and then um, draw a triangle and figure out both the length and the direction of that hypotenuse, that resultant vector that results from those two sides. And if I do that, and if you do that, what we'll find is that there's an overall net force of 5 newtons directed um, at 36.9 degrees north of west, which is the same as 53.1 degrees west of north. Same thing. Okay. So the next question then is why would I want to calculate net force? So that's the reason to, to draw free body diagrams, but then why does net force matter? Um, and here's the thing. Net force determines how the object's going to move. Like that net force is the impetus for all the changes in that object's motion. Anytime an object is moving, it's because there, there was some sort of net force applied to it at some point, which is pretty cool. Okay. Now, um, this brings us to Newton's first law, which you've probably heard at some point in your life. Um, Newton's first law says that an object's state of motion, and that's just a fancy term for velocity, the velocity, the speed and direction of an object, will not change unless it's acted upon by a non-zero net force. Okay, so that means that um, if an object is just sitting there, there better be some overall push or pull on it in order for it to start moving, which makes sense. But this also means that if an object is moving at a certain velocity, say five meters per second to the east, it's gonna keep on moving at that same velocity of five meters per second to the east, unless there's some sort of overall unbalanced push or pull on it to cause it to change that motion. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard the, the idea of like, you know, objects at rest tend to stay at rest and objects in motion tend to stay in motion. That's the idea behind Newton's first law. Things will keep doing what they're doing unless there is some non-zero net force that's acting upon it. Now we have a, a special term for when the net force on an object is zero, which is to say that all the, the forces perfectly balance out. So if I've got a pull of, of three newtons to the right, then we must also have a pull of three newtons to the left. Or if we have a pull of five newtons to the north, we better have um, a pull of five newtons to the south as well. So if all those different force uh, vectors are balanced and we, we've got an overall net force of zero, we call that state equilibrium. 
Okay. And just to drive this point home once again, if an object is in equilibrium, which is to say that there's no net force on it, it's either going to be at rest, not moving, or it could be moving at constant velocity. You, some of you guys are going to fight me on this. Some of you are going to say if an object is moving, there must be some sort of net force on it. That's not true. If it is moving at a constant velocity, there is no net force on it. Because remember, forces cause an acceleration. So if an object isn't accelerating, there's no net force on it. All right. So um, our special term for that condition is equilibrium. Okay, everything's balanced out. Now the reason for all of, of this, the reason that objects will keep doing what they're doing, is that we have this, um, this inherent uh, quality in all matter that it will uh, tend to resist changes in motion. It's like us, if we're lying in bed, we tend to resist getting out of bed because we like just staying where we are. Now this property is called inertia. Now if you do a quick thought experiment and think about, okay, which would be um, easier to change the motion of a freight train or a butterfly, we can pretty quickly see then that the amount of inertia that an object has is dependent upon its mass. So the, the more massive, the heavier an object is, the harder it is to either get it to start moving or stop it from moving. So like, imagine just holding out your hand to stop a freight train. Um, compare that to something with less mass, like a butterfly, pretty easy to stop. So when we think about mass, we can think of it as um, the amount of matter in an object, but we can also think of mass as a measure of the amount of inertia something has. Kind of a cool way to think about it. Okay. So all that is to say, um, then if there's a, a non-zero net force, so we considered the, the zero net force option, if there's a non-zero net force on an object, that means it has to accelerate, no exceptions. Okay, so if my forces acting on my object based on my free body diagram do not all cancel out based on their, their directions that they're going in, um, that object's going to accelerate in whatever direction that overall force is, whatever's left over once I've, I've tried to cancel out all my vectors, it's going to accelerate in that direction. Okay, so let's consider a, a few examples. So, um, book sitting on the table, what's the net force that's being exerted on it? And I hope that you can, can see that the net force on that book is going to have to be zero because it's not moving. So that means that there's no overall force on it. Everything's balanced out, the gravitational force and the normal force exerted upward. They perfectly cancel each other out. So that the net force on the book is zero. It's just sitting there. Okay. How about um, a hockey puck that's hockey puck, hockey puck that's uh, sliding on the ice at a constant velocity of five meters per second to the east? Okay. Now this one, some of you are going to be thrown off, but don't be deceived. The key word there was constant velocity. It's not accelerating, so that means that there's a net force of zero on that puck. Now it's true, at some point, some force must have been exerted on it to get it to start moving at that velocity of five meters per second to the east. But now that it's just moving at that constant velocity, that means all the forces acting on it are perfectly balanced out right now. Okay. Next question. So we've got an object at the right. I've drawn a, a little free body diagram for it. We want to figure out what's the net force that's being exerted upon it. And again, we'll use our little vector addition skills, although this one's pretty simple since everything's in the y direction. We see that the overall unbalanced net force on this object is two newtons to the north. Okay, because we've got five up, three down. So overall, we're left with two, two newtons that have been um, unbalanced directed towards the north. And just for funsies, tell me then, if this object is currently moving south, and then we apply these two forces, what's going to happen to its motion? So take a, a little bit and just think about that. We've got a net force directed to the north. The object was moving to the south. What's going to happen to it? Now what we can conclude is the object accelerates in the direction of the net force. So since the net force is directed to the north, that means the object is going to accelerate towards the north. And if we recall from our first unit, if velocity is directed towards the south and acceleration is directed towards the north, they oppose each other, that's going to cause our object to slow down.
All right, folks, that's all I have for you. You should be ready now for the net force problems, and I'll see you soon.